George Best was a diamond. There was a little flaw there. Right from the start, people, I think, knew that George had got something a bit special about him. He was such a, an unbelievably gifted player. He had a, a quality and he had a control that, that really was un, unparalleled, really. Good looking, a bit like the Beatles, you know, that hairstyle, etc. A thing of beauty, and we didn't get it all. And he didn't get it all either. I know that at the end of it all, the people remember me first and foremost for what I could do on the field. And remember, people still say to me, oh, I remember that day. And uh, hopefully they'll, they'll always remember the football side of it and, and why the crowds came. It was like the passage of a shooting star. George Best's genius on a football field shone brilliantly for some years. And when it faded, left us with those amazing memories. George's story started in Belfast on the 22nd of May, 1946. He was the son of Dick and Annie Best, who lived on the Craigie estate in the southeast of the city. Soon enough, it became obvious that George had a very special talent with a football. There were fears that he may have been too small to make it as a professional. But that didn't stop Bob Bishop, the Manchester United scout, who called Matt Busby to tell him he'd found a genius. Bob Bishop, the scout from Manchester United, virtually turned up on our doorstep one day and asked if I'd, I'd like to go to Manchester United, and it was as simple as that. I was playing football at the top of the street when it happened, so my, my parents called me down and, and explained to me. And, I mean, I was in the daze, obviously. I dashed out of the, the house, straight back up to the, the game that was going on at the top of the street, and just ran on and told all my friends I was going to play for Manchester United. That was it, you know, there was <laughs> no trial period, no signing on, I, it was all done. It wasn't quite as simple as that for the 15-year-old boy from Belfast. He was offered a two-week trial and travelled across the Irish Sea with another youngster, Eric McMordy, to board with Mrs Fullaway in Manchester. But the two kids were overawed by the club and the city and ran back to Belfast at the earliest opportunity. George, though, came back and settled into life in Manchester, writing letters back home to Belfast about his adventures with Manchester United stars. Harry was like typical, you know, lunatic goalkeeper. You know, you don't score against him, whether it was in practice or in, in, you know, in a proper game. And, and Harry was no different. I had been at the top as a player and I was playing in a five-a-side with small goals against a bunch of young kids, 15 years of age. And this kid came up and put the ball past me and I didn't know what had happened. And I thought, you've slipped a bit. And he did it again. I didn't know at the time, but he's thinking, you know, this cheeky little kid, you know, I'll get him next time. Anyway, it happened two or three times. And he did it the third time, and I said, son, you do that again, I'll break your neck. If I hadn't been Irish, I think he'd have probably buried me then and there. And he, he, he talked about it in later years. And it was, I mean, to me, it was a, a great compliment. George was joined at Mrs Fullaway's by another future United star, David Sadler who took these early shots of the youngster who was causing so much excitement at Old Trafford. It's one thing to say um, young boys are going to be good players. It, it's a total different thing to say that they're going to be superstars and world stars, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, right from the start, people, I think, knew that George had got something a bit special about him. As a 17-year-old, George broke into the Manchester United first team and scored six goals in his first season. But the most poignant memories go back to his debut against West Bromwich Albion in September 1963. Yeah. 
The one thing that stands out is the actual running onto the field before the game. Uh, I mean, a tunnel at United is on a, on a high level. You know, you, you don't actually see the crowd until you're about halfway through it, or you see the start of the crowd. So it's like turning the volume up on a, on a radio, where it just got louder and louder. I mean, that feeling will stay with me for the rest of my life. I mean, the hair's in the back of my head still. But once I actually got out there and started knocking the ball around, it was, it was just another game. And I, I did exactly the same things in the first team as I'd been doing with the junior teams. The young Irishman knew no fear and was fast becoming a phenomenon with Manchester United in the first division as they took the title in 1965. Back home too, the boy from the Craigie estate was making an impression. Plans were underway to bring him into the Northern Ireland team. It was Harry Gregg who tipped off the Ireland manager, Bertie Peacock. I rang Bertie's bar and told Bertie about a youngster that was playing at United called George Best. And Bertie Peacock put it down in writing. He gave him his first cap against Wales because of the telephone call I'd made. He'd never seen him play. It was the first of George Best's 37 caps for Northern Ireland. The Manchester United star was fast becoming a hero back home. There was a curiosity when uh, he began to play for uh, uh, United regularly. And of course, when his genius came through, thanks to uh, television, uh, he became the idol uh, of Northern Ireland. He could walk in water and George Best is idolised still by many people in Northern Ireland. Whether George was playing for Manchester United or Northern Ireland, the goals and the admirers kept coming. George Best's star was rising along with the talented Manchester United team that Matt Busby had put together. There were established stars at Old Trafford like Dennis Law and Bobby Charlton, but even they were impressed with the youngster from Belfast. He could control the ball, his left foot, his right foot, it was not a great problem to him. He could turn on a sixpence, he could... Uh... He had an unbelievable vision. He could tell everything that was happening around. He knew exactly where people were. And, uh, and it, that, that gave him all the time that he needed to actually express himself. In time, the combination of George Best, Dennis Law and Bobby Charlton became one of the most potent partnerships English football has ever seen. The thing about football, playing in a team like, like we had, the beauty about it is that when you play with great players, the game is easy. I used to think sometimes, that, you know, if I was a Man United supporter, it must, it must be great going down to Old Trafford just, just at this particular time. The fans had to go down because they were afraid that they might just miss that one game where George Best was absolutely sensational. Or where Dennis Lowe had uh, sparks seemed to fly wherever he was going and it was so exciting. And I scored a few goals as well from different distances, you know, and. Uh, and whenever anybody mentions, mentions best the best little child, I get a little, you get a little buzz, you know, I think, you know, that was great. While his teammates were mostly married, George was a good-looking single man who was becoming a superstar. Thank you. In those days, he spent a lot of time with the Manchester City midfielder, Mike Summerby. Most of the players at United were married and most of the players at City were, were married, so really I'm a single lad in the 60s in Manchester, which was quite amazing, especially for two people like George, who comes from Belfast and I came from Swindon. You can imagine the 60s in Manchester, it was phenomenal. Football was all he lived for, all, the, all this other stuff that was now coming his way, and all the adulation and uh, the girls and things were more or less throwing themselves at him. Certainly in those early days, the, the other stuff was just happening and it was almost happening to somebody else. Life as a football star continued at a furious pace, but the fires of fame were always fueled by his remarkable talents on the field. 
He had pace. Self-belief. He had the most fantastic ability to play football. George was completely and totally nerveless. He was going out onto a pitch in front of 100,000 people as if he was going out on the street to play in the streets of Belfast. He could evade the most vicious of tackles. He was so brave physically. We played Chelsea in a floodlit match at Old Trafford and he, he was hit a couple of times really hard you know, in the hit and he still stood up and he kidded the goalkeeper who went to his right and then he just walked around him and put the ball in the back of the net. So tough and brave. Beautiful player. He could score from it at all, whatever angle, right side, left side, centre. He was just, just a marvellous player. I always felt like an entertainer right there and I knew I could get the crowd excited by doing little things like that and trying things differently. You know, if I was playing against a, a player in particular who was giving me a hard time, who was getting stuck in, you know, I would stand on the ball and ask tell him to come and get it off me and, and it, I mean, the crowd went crazy. And I, and I loved it, you know, it was great. It was, to me, it was pure theatre. I, I did it. I did it on purpose because I knew it got the crowd excited. In Lisbon, March 1966, George announced his astonishing talents to an international audience. His performance demolished the great Benfica in a 5-1 win, scoring two early goals for United. The Portuguese press were so amazed that they called him El Beetle. Coming back in the plane, he had this from Barrow, and I'm the fellow who said to him, take it off your head. Take it off your head. Great players don't need gimmicks. And the rest, leave him alone. I said, take it off your head. But it was too late to slow George's life down. No way to control the shooting star. Walking down the streets, you'd see then traffic stopped. People were stopping, old ladies, young ladies, older men, everybody, you know, wherever you walked down. And he just signed his autographs and carried on. He was really, you know, he was really causing quite a stir. But nobody really knew quite how.